Pushkin. That was really the moment that I realized whatever future I'd imagined for myself not only wasn't going to happen in the way that I'd planned, but that I might not get to exist in the future at all. Suleika Jawad was diagnosed with an aggressive form of leukemia when she was 22 years old. As she faced her mortality, she felt clarity about how exactly she wanted to spend her time. I felt a real sense of liberation to do the things I wanted to do simply because they nourished me, because they felt life-giving, and not because they were the things I thought I should be doing. And so for the first time in my life, I began creating entirely for myself. On today's episode, why survival is its own kind of creative act. I'm Maya Shunker, and this is A Slight Change of Plans, a show about who we are and who we become in the face of a big change. Okay, so full confession. I'm obsessed with Suleika Jawad. Her mind and heart speak to me in a way few people do. I followed her writing from afar over the years, and I found her honesty so startling. At times, it's taken my breath away. Suleika is unafraid to tackle some of the hardest questions we face as humans. When she first started working on her memoir, a friend told her about a saying they'd heard. If you want to write a good memoir, share what you don't want other people to know about you. If you want to write a great memoir, share what you don't want to know about yourself. Suleika wrote a great memoir. The title of her book, Between Two Kingdoms, A Memoir of a Life Interrupted, is a nod to the writer Susan Sontag. Sontag wrote that everyone who is born holds dual citizenship, in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Suleika writes about her experience in both these kingdoms and the difficulty of navigating the space that lies between them. Her story begins in 2010. She just graduated from Princeton University and had big dreams for the road ahead. So much of my sense of self-worth, like most type A strivers, was wrapped up in my plans for the future. And I had all kinds of one-year and five-year and 10-year plans. And I had a dream of becoming a war correspondent. I wanted to report from North Africa, where I'm originally from, where my entire family currently lives. But also, like a lot of 22-year-olds, I had no idea what the future actually had in store for me. I had lots of daydreams and plans, but I didn't really know who I was yet. And so what I decided to do was to take a job as a paralegal at a law firm in Paris and to take the time I needed to find my way. And, you know, there was this sense of endless time, as there often is when you're young, time to figure out what you want, time to figure out who you want to become and how to plot the distance between you and that person. And so I was brimming with joy, brimming with a little bit of anxiety about finding my way forward. But it was really this sense of being on the edge of something exciting. Yeah. So you had had worrying health symptoms for some time. And when you were in Paris, things got worse. Can you tell me about how your health was starting to fail? It began with an itch, this relentless, maddening itch on my skin that popped up during my senior year of college. And followed by that was fatigue and frequent infections and viruses. But every single time I went to a doctor, they would look at whatever specific ailment I was coming in 
treat that and then send me home. And so it took about a year and a half until I was about six months into my time in Paris. And I had grown so pale that my skin looked almost translucent. And I was so exhausted that I was drinking, you know, up to eight espressos every day to get through my job at the law firm and spending my lunch hour napping in the office closet, that it began to occur to me that something was deeply wrong. But as is often the case, especially for young people, especially for women, the challenge of Getting an actual diagnosis proved to be so much harder than I possibly could have imagined. You know, we have so many examples throughout history where a woman's physical affliction is attributed to their mind, to a sense of hysteria. And that's very much how I felt. I kept saying, I think something is wrong. I've never been sick in my life. I've never even broken a bone and I can barely function. I so often would find myself on an exam table feeling like I wasn't being taken seriously, feeling like I wasn't being believed. A doctor I saw prescribed anti-anxiety medications to me. Another that hospitalized me for a week and ran every test they could think of released me with a discharge of burnout syndrome. And I felt this sense of intimidation that I think many of us have felt when we're in a doctor's office, Mm. the sense that they had the medical degrees, not me. Who was I to question their judgment? And so at the end of this confusing year and a half, ultimately, I found myself in an emergency room in Paris with blood counts so low that I had to immediately get on a plane back home to upstate New York, because if they dropped any lower, I wasn't going to be able to fly at all. And it was shortly thereafter that I learned I had been diagnosed with an aggressive form of leukemia. And it was one of those bifurcating moments in a life where even though at 22, I couldn't really wrap my head around what this illness meant for me. I didn't have friends who had suffered from cancer and I didn't really have anything to sort of give me an indication of what it was going to be like. But I knew immediately that whatever sense of innocence I'd had um, had been buried and that everything was going to be different from there on out. What were you told about your prognosis at the time? And what was it like to leave behind all of those dreams and hopes that you had been carrying just, you know, weeks prior about what your future was going to look like? So initially, I did all the Googling that they tell you not to do. And I I knew from the very start that my prognosis was not good, that the cards were stacked against me. They told me I had about a 35% chance of long-term survival. But when I entered the hospital, I still had a kind of naivete about what this whole experience was going to be like. I packed a suitcase full of books, like War and Peace, and I cheerfully (laughs) announced to my parents that I was going to use this summer uh, in the hospital to read through the rest of the Western canon. I thought I was going to write a book. I thought I was going to do all these things. And of course, I didn't end up doing any of those things. And it was a slow, crushing realization that to hold on to the person I'd been And all of the dreams and plans that that person had was only going to be a recipe for defeat and discouragement. And by the end of that summer, I had lost about 40 pounds. I had lost all my hair, my eyelashes, my eyebrows. But worse than that, I had learned that the standard chemotherapy I'd been doing all summer not only hadn't worked, but that my leukemia was even more aggressive and that my only option was going to be a clinical trial. 
you went from assuming that you were going to have this relatively short stay, I mean, not just short stay, so like in your case, but like highly productive reading War and Peace stay, which, by the way, will never, ever be in the cards for me, ever, uh, no matter <laughs> what illnesses I face. Um, I'm more in the Mindy Kaling, you know, memoir yes. space. Um, and then and then you find out this devastating news, which is, OK, you're going to have to enter this clinical trial. What was it like to have the goalposts change like that? I was devastated. I remember it so clearly. It was the morning of my 23rd birthday. Hmm. And I had packed up everything in my room because I wanted so badly to be discharged. I had taken down the posters and the get well cards. And the hope from the very beginning was that I would get into remission. But the challenge was that I not only couldn't get into remission, but my leukemia was running rampant throughout my entire body. I felt when I received that news, the scaffolding inside of me crumble. It felt like a breach of contract with the natural order of things because youth and health are supposed to go hand in hand. And that began a very different chapter where I really retreated into myself. I had this window overlooking Central Park from my hospital room, which was a great privilege to have landed in this room by chance. And I remember closing the blinds because what had once brought me comfort to be able, you know, to see the world continuing to move suddenly felt like a reminder that whatever future I'd imagined for myself not only wasn't going to happen in the way that I'd planned, but that I might not get to exist in the future at all. And so for the next couple of months, I sank into a pretty deep well of depression. I no longer wanted to have visits from friends. I stopped reading, stopped making plans. I instead filled my days by trying to set the world record for the number of Grey's Anatomy episodes watched <laughs> consecutively. And I was angry. I remember, you know, being told stories of cancer survivors who had gone on to do extraordinary things and feeling such rage at the idea that anything about what I was living could be useful, could be turned into anything other than what it was, which was a deep sense of isolation and a deep sense of fear about what was to come. Yeah. When they told you you'd have to enroll in this clinical trial, what was the chance of a successful outcome? I had no idea. And that's what made it especially challenging. The clinical trial that I enrolled in was a phase two clinical trial, meaning they not only didn't know if it was safe, but they had no idea if it was going to be effective. Wow. Okay. And it really required what I can only describe as a leap of faith mm -hmm. to submit my body, to submit my family to what ended up being a harrowing and grueling experience. Yeah. I do wonder whether it was ever a question of whether you were going to go through with the treatment. I could easily imagine myself saying, like, please, everyone I love, spare me this pain and suffering, like, I'd rather just go. We had so many difficult conversations as a family, mm -hmm. especially because the side effects of the clinical trial were so brutal that they became nearly lethal on a number of occasions. And I ended up spending about four out of the next eight months in isolation in the hospital warding off everything from septic shock to life-threatening infections and fevers. And that was the impossible Sophie's choice. Yeah. You know, is this going to kill me? Is this going to save me? 
but I would say things to my parents sometimes when I felt I was really in a low down place that, you know, maybe I was better off stopping the clinical trial, doing some kind of make a wish bucket list trip to some tropical island and smoking pot and doing whatever else it was that uh, I wanted to do. And, and, and more than anything, to really savor whatever time I had left with them, with my friends, with my loved ones, rather than, you know, torturing myself with these treatments. But I had this amazing oncologist, the late Dr. James Holland, who, when I was at my most defeated place, began during his lunch hour coming to my hospital room with his paper bag of sandwiches and sitting by my bed and talking to me, not about my latest biopsy results or blood counts, but he would ask me what I majored in in college, Hmm. what my most daring dreams were, uh, what I wanted to do after all of this was over. And it always confused me because I felt like he's this busy man, you know, why is he doing this? Um, And I realize now that he was reminding me of who I was outside of these hospital rooms and trying to keep that sense of hope alive for me. Yeah. It sounds like you were forced to stare death in the face. And Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether it shifted your perspective on anything or or taught you something about yourself? Yeah. You know, I think the experience of confronting death uh, strangely can have a clarifying effect. All Mm. the artifice gets stripped away. And for me, I felt my self rerouting my priorities. What had felt important even just a few months before no longer mattered. It didn't matter that I'd strived and strived and strived. It didn't matter that I had all of these ambitions or that I had been a hard worker. What mattered to me was simple. I Mm. wanted to spend as much time with my loved ones as I could. And I think what it did for me was that it released me from any sense of self-imposed or external expectation. For the first time in my life, I was free of expectation. Uh, For the first time in my life, my parents, you know, were overjoyed and would pat me on the back if I managed to walk half a block Mm. to come home. That's how low the bar was set for me. And what surprised me is that I felt a real sense of liberation to do the things I wanted to do simply because they nourished me, because they felt life-giving, and not because they were the things I thought I should be doing. And so for the first time in my life, I began creating entirely for myself. I began keeping a journal that I used as a sort of reporter's notebook, where I would you know, write about the different patients I was befriending. Um, you know, the guy down the hall who was trying to encourage everyone to mount a hunger strike because our meal trays kept arriving with the food still frozen. I wrote about the nurses and the gossip uh, <laughs> that I'd overhear by their station. I the wrote real about... life Grey's Anatomy plot line. Exactly. I love it. <laughs> exactly. I once asked a young resident if her life resembled the cast of Grey's Anatomy in any way, and she told me that everyone slept around just as much Uh, but that everyone was also far less attractive, uh, which was fun for me (laughs) because I got to sort of project all sorts of steamy plot twists um, to everyone coming into my room. Um, But I was doing things for the first time in my life without any sense of it leading to something, without worrying about productivity or output, Wow, that is that is so powerful. And it, it just strikes me as I look at my own life. I don't think I've ever experienced a period of my life in which I did not feel almost an obsessive need to be productive and meet expectations. 
I think most of us feel that way. That was something I also hadn't experienced probably from the time that I was like four or five years old when I could make a big glorious mess with finger pains and revel in the mess and not worry about if it was any good. And I think, you know, shedding that pressure to do something well allowed me to play and to experiment with different forms in a way that I wouldn't have allowed myself. I wouldn't have allowed myself the time to just try things for the hell of trying them. Yeah. To read things because they piqued my interest and I didn't know why. And I never had that luxury of time, which is an irony because of course, you know, time felt more precious and fleeting than ever before. And in writing in that way, I wasn't concerned with writing well or beautifully or even Mm. grammatically. I was really interested in pushing myself to dig for the truth beneath the truth beneath the truth. I wasn't trying to impress anyone. I wasn't trying to sound smarter than I was, to imitate anyone. I was just following the thread of curiosity wherever it led me. And so because I was so mired in uncertainty, I had no idea what the next couple of hours were going to bring, let alone the next day or the next week. And because initially that writing was just for myself, for the first time in my life, I felt like I had finally found my voice. We'll be back in a moment with a slight change of plans. Against the odds, and after months of grueling chemotherapy and extreme isolation, Suleika's clinical trial was deemed a success. The next step in her treatment would be a bone marrow transplant a high-risk, complex procedure, and her only chance at survival. As her transplant approached, she began reflecting on what exactly she wanted to say about her experience with cancer. I began to read every illness narrative that I could get my hands on, but so many of them, though beautifully written and wrenching and you know, profound, didn't speak to me because more often than not, they were written from the perspective of someone who had survived. And I started to notice that there was this kind of hero's journey arc to illness narratives where you return from the thing that nearly killed you better and braver and stronger for what you've been through. And that couldn't have applied less to me. I was terrified. I was struggling. I was isolated. And I wanted to put all of that into ink. And so what I began to do was to write about the very things that felt impossible to talk about. I wrote about the infertility caused by my cancer treatments. I wrote about the experience of falling in love while falling sick. I wrote about the in-betweenness of young adulthood. I wrote about navigating our healthcare system and all of its complexities. I wrote about the sense of guilt and the feeling of being a burden that so often comes when you're acutely sick. I wrote about all of it. Toni Morrison said, if you want to read a book and it doesn't exist, then you must write it. And so I think in my own small way, that was my version of doing that. And so I decided because I was pretty limited within my options to start a blog, a really simple blog. And it felt so good to have a job that I could do other than merely being a patient. And to my great surprise, the blog was passed around and a journalism professor of mine uh, sent it along to an editor at the New York Times. And she called me up and asked if I might want to publish an essay. And because I was facing the possibility of imminent death, I shot my shot and I said, I don't want to write an essay. What I'd like to write is a weekly column 
written from the trenches of that uncertainty where you don't know how the story is going to end. Mm. And I went on and on and on. And at the end of it, to my great surprise and then terror, she said, okay, um, we will try it for a couple of installments and see how it goes. And I had never been published before. I never had a byline and certainly not in a place like the New York Times. And what began as elation immediately turned to a sense of, oh shit, how am I going to pull this (laughs) off? (laughs) What did it feel like to put these essays, this column out into the world while you were so unbelievably sick and going through the bone marrow transplant? It was extraordinarily challenging, in large part because I had new limitations. I was Mm. exhausted. I was physically ill in ways that were unpredictable. And so I would work in these short 10-minute installments throughout the day and take naps in between. And it was slow and plodding and frustrating. And of course, there were many moments where I felt, you know, this deep sense of anger at how different my body was. And I felt this sense of my ambition, you know, bumping up against my limitations. But it was also an exercise for me, a first lesson really in not only accepting those limitations, but trying to find creative workarounds. And it occurred to me as I started to look to examples throughout history of artists and writers who found themselves in similar situations that the limitations could actually be creatively generative themselves. Mm. So I was obsessed with Frida Kahlo, who at a similar age had, of course, found herself in bed and began making, you know, these beautiful, heartbreaking self-portraits that led to her becoming one of the most well-known artists throughout time. I read Sarah Manguso, I read Lucy Grayley, and I began to get curious about how my limitations, while challenging, were actually twisting my mind out of its usual rut. And I began to realize that really, you know, survival is its own kind of creative act. When you have chemo sores in your mouth and throat that make it impossible to speak, you have to find new ways to communicate. When you're confined to a bed, you have to use your imagination to travel. When you can't move, you have to find new ways of entertaining yourself. And so I began to get curious about that and open to whatever it was that emerged. And what was the response like to the column? The column, which was called Life Interrupted, launched during that first week in the bone marrow transplant unit. And it was such a bizarre moment of contrast because I was sicker than I'd ever been. And the morning after um, the column went live, I opened my inbox and found hundreds and hundreds of letters and notes from people all across the world. And after being so profoundly isolated for a year, it was like this portal had opened onto the rest of the world. And I felt a sense of connection that I hadn't felt before. I heard from a young man down the hall away from me in the transplant unit who was going through the same thing I was going through. And I never met anybody my age with my same illness. And I'll never forget one day when I was being wheeled down the hall to get a CT scan, I paused at his door and we couldn't meet because the germ risk was too high, but I knocked on the window and he waved and I waved. And just that tiny little moment, that sense of being seen and known and that you're not alone and that particular kind of suffering gave me a sense of hope that fueled me in those coming weeks. Um, What surprised me most, though, was I wasn't just hearing from young people with cancer. I was hearing 
from all kinds of people dealing with all kinds of life interruptions. And one of the very first letters I received was from a man by the name of Quentin Jones, who was on death row in Texas. And he had read a column where I'd written about that sense of being in solitary confinement as I was, that sense of waiting for a verdict that is going to determine your future. For me, of course, you know, that verdict, that biopsy results and all kinds of other tests. And he wrote me this beautiful letter in longhand cursive. And he explained that he had been on death row for more than half his life from the age of 18. And that even though, of course, our circumstances were different, he understood how it felt to be confronting your mortality Mm. and waiting to find out where the gavel landed. And it was just one of the most humbling, dizzying experiences I've ever had. But more than that, you know, I think there's a way in which when you're in pain, that pain can turn you selfish. And in a way, it's necessary. You have to be preoccupied with what's happening with your body and accounting how you're feeling and, you know, making sure that you're keeping yourself alive. But in the act of writing, in the act of daring to be vulnerable, which had felt frightening and uncomfortable, I realized that deep unvarnished vulnerability creates a reverberation where vulnerability begets vulnerability, begets vulnerability. And so in writing my story, I was getting the privilege of hearing so many stories from so many different people, from so many different walks of life. Um, And it was, I think, a much needed reminder for me that we all have these life-interrupted moments, these things that happen that bring you to the floor. And there was a kind of equalizing sense to that, a sense that I wasn't alone and that I wasn't special and that I was part of, you know, the human experience. Yeah, I'm getting emotional in this moment because one of those messages was from me. (laughs) I remember I, I... I read, I I think I reached out to you on Facebook, but I was, I think we're around the same age. I was in my early 20s. I remember when your first column came out. I remember experiencing, I mean, again, nothing, well, we're not supposed to compare suffering, so I'm not going to do that for your sake. No suffering Olympics. (laughs) I know, no suffering Olympics. But I I had been experiencing just one of the most uh, acute, crippling bouts of anxiety that I'd Mm. ever experienced. And your column was so transformative for me. So like, thank you, I guess, oh. in hindsight, uh-huh. for for the way that you made me feel in that moment and for what you did for young, like 20-something Maya. I mean, I can't imagine the number of lives that you've um, you touched through the column, but just a personal thank you from me thank for that. You. Now I'm crying. <laughs> Luckily, this is a podcast. <laughs> Yeah, yeah exactly. no one can see the the drippy mascara. <laughs> yeah, but but I I think what's what's interesting looking back is when I sent you that note, like I wasn't ready to be vulnerable about the anxiety that I was facing, but it was enough for me as a reader to see that you were. Mm-hmm. Like that's part of the equation for progress is you just see it reflected in someone else, and you'll take your own time with whatever your own things are, but eventually you'll feel comfortable talking mm-hmm. about them. I feel the same way. And I think, you know, more than a writer, I'm a reader first. And and part of why I've always been a ravenous reader, you know, from the time I was very little was that moment that I'm sure you've had that maybe someone listening has had where you're reading a novel or a memoir or a poem and you glimpse a sense of recognition, Hmm. uh, a sense of being known or of thinking, oh, I didn't know I was allowed to admit that. I didn't know I was allowed to feel that or to say that. And that is the moment that I'm always 
looking for when I'm reading and it's the moment I'm always striving for when I'm creating and writing. Mm. Well, mission accomplished. (laughs) (laughs) So just to bring listeners up to speed on your situation. So the bone marrow transplant ended up being a success. But even though you are now in remission, your treatment did not end there, right? You would need to take maintenance chemotherapy for several years to help prevent the leukemia from coming back. I'm so curious to know, what was that period of time like for you? It was a strange time in my life because, you know, I felt this pressure to get back to it, to get back to the land of the living. But the reality was that my transplant and the treatment I had done had left these permanent imprints on my life. Everything from really reckoning, say, with the loss of my fertility and the idea of motherhood as I'd known it to a deep sense of anxiety. I think that comes when the ceiling has caved in on you and you no longer assume structural stability. I didn't feel safe in my body. Mm. Every cough sparked a fear of relapse. Every, you know, voicemail from the doctor's office would send my pulse racing. And I think, you know, more than anything, when I was finally done with that maintenance chemo, when the port in my chest was removed, I expected to feel a deep sense of gratitude and relief. Mm. And more than that, I expected to quickly and organically fold back into the world of the living. But that didn't happen, at least not in the way that I'd hoped. I was really struggling. I you know, had spent at that point four years in the kingdom of the sick that had been my whole world. And I had figured out, you know, how to build a home for myself there. I'd even carved out a career within its confines. And to my surprise, it was the outside world that suddenly felt scary and Mm. overwhelming to me. I was no longer a patient and I couldn't go back to 22 year old me, but I had no idea who I was and how to find my way forward. And I felt a deep sense of shame because I was alive. I was lucky to be alive. I knew that so well out of the 10 young cancer comrades, as we called each other, um, that I befriended during my time in treatment. Only three of us were still there. And I felt that I should move on with my life. And as it turned out, moving on began to feel more like a mirage or a myth because we don't get to compartmentalize the most painful parts of our past. We can't, you know, skip over the hard work of healing and grieving. And so instead, I began the long journey, not of moving on, but of trying to find my way forward, to move forward with all that had happened. Yeah, in in listening to you, I'm hearing what a unique kind of loneliness post-remission life presents to a person because, and it's so rarely spoken about, which is there's this idea, you know, you're one of the lucky ones, Suleika, just like go take your success story and move on. And um, it's such a disservice to the transition and how hard that kind of re-entry is. Yeah. You know, it's when you're in the throes of cancer and you tell people, I have aggressive leukemia. There's an instant kind of compassion Mm. or or sympathy they can lend you. When you tell people, I'm a recent cancer survivor, you don't... What they say is congratulations. Congratulations, (gasps) right? I mean, that's that's the problem. Congratulations. Whereas the reaction maybe, I mean, it should be maybe congratulations, but like maybe not. And and if it is congratulations, then it's congratulations and let's have a yes. discussion, you know? Yes. Um, yeah. So just tell me more, more about that. Yeah. So, you know, while in treatment, I'd had this cavalry of doctors and friends and family surrounding me. And pretty instantly when I got that 
all clear, done with chemo, I had this sense that everyone around me thought it was over, maybe because they wanted so badly to think it was over, but it wasn't over. I was, you know, really grappling with what I later understood to be PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, because I had been so focused on surviving for four years, it hadn't even occurred to me that there's a wide gap between surviving and living. And that while I was an expert at surviving, I didn't know how to live. Mm. And in a strange sense, it was the hardest, most isolating transition because I didn't have treatment protocols. I didn't have doctors telling me what to do. I was entirely on my own to figure out how to make this transition. And so at first, I almost like an anthropologist might was like looking around at my friends and thinking to myself, what does a normal, healthy 26-year-old woman do? And trying to emulate that, which of course, you know, wasn't working. I was still healing physically from this experience, but more Mm. than that, emotionally and spiritually. And it took me a while to understand and, and acknowledge to myself that the hardest part of this experience was going to be its aftermath because that's where my own work was going to begin. And as much as we think of recovery as some sort of gentle self-care spree involving, you know, massage therapy and, you know, whatever else, for me at least, it was truly this kind of terrifying brute act of discovery. Hey, thanks so much for listening. There's so much more of Suleika's story I want to share with you. So we've released a part two of our conversation that you can listen to now. We talk about the creative and adventurous way Suleika navigated her transition back to the kingdom of the well. We also talk about her recent experience re-entering the kingdom of the sick. Relapse was my biggest fear. It was this fear that I had nursed in the early years and that had slowly, little by little, shrunk, but it was always a specter. And so to be confronted with that worst fear for it to come to pass was devastating. The second part of the story is available now in the feed for A Slight Change of Plans. If you enjoyed our conversation, we on the Slight Change team would really appreciate if you could share this episode with someone you know who's going through their own life-interrupted moment and needs some help navigating that uncertainty. We'd also be grateful if you took a moment to follow the show on your podcast app of choice and to write a review. It helps more people discover the show and helps us keep making more episodes for you. Thanks so much. A Slight Change of Plans is created, written, and executive produced by me, Maya Shunker. The Slight Change family includes our showrunner, Tyler Green, our senior editor, Kate Parkinson Morgan, our senior producer, Trisha Bobita, and our engineer, Erica Huang. Luis Guerra wrote our delightful theme song, and Ginger Smith helped arrange the vocals. A Slight Change of Plans is a production of Pushkin Industries, so a big thanks to everyone there. And of course, a very special thanks to Jimmy Lee. You can follow A Slight Change of Plans on Instagram at Dr. Maya Shunker. See you next week.